Hey guys, I'm super excited. Hi y'all, um, I'm Kate Wolf. I am the Do The Work co-chair alongside Graham Nolan. Uh, and I oversee programming and operations here for the organization. Um, this is our second edition of Open Office Hours. Uh, so this will be a short, hopefully, introduction period. And the last part that you'll see me as the only person on screen as I hope to have a pretty dynamic conversation and we hope to have a pretty dynamic conversation where everybody gets to contribute. But for those that are new, I just want to quickly go over a few things about Do the Work. Uh, Do the Work is a queer grassroots organization and creative platform and community. Um, we look to empower ad industry and the marketers alike to inspire, reward, and celebrate queer creativity within marketing and advertising, as well as culture. Um, we know that active inclusion of queer talent unleashes untapped potential uh, and creative potential. And of course, and very importantly, will advance business for everybody. As the core team, the court here, and the two leads of Do The Work, we are true believers that when everybody can be their truest form of themselves, every person will win. Um, and for that, you know, today we're gonna talk a little bit about human behavior. Um, I am a huge behavioral nerd, so I'm gonna get really deep into this, but um, human behavior rapport and the relationships that we build with each other, brands, and communities. This is a completely interactive opportunity for us to learn from you guys, as well as for you to learn from us and share our different perspectives. Here's what you can expect. Once we share a little bit more about today's topic, we'll switch over to a grid view. Uh, we want people to speak up. We want people to press the raise your hand button. Don't just do this on camera, but actually click the button itself. Um, so our moderator, Jake, who is that lovely man behind the curtain, he's going to be able to turn on your mic and open it up so you can speak. If you're comfortable, please turn on your camera. If you're not, do what you gotta do. Don't, this is a safe space. We don't wanna force anybody to do anything that they want, don't want. This is a space that everybody should feel comfortable in and comfortable enough to share. Um, after about a minute, uh, we'll be respectful for everybody's points, but we'll let everybody complete their points in about a minute or two, and then we'll move on to the next raised hand or next person. This is going to be chosen randomly um, just by Jake of who he sees first, so there's no rhyme or reason behind it, just so you guys know. Um, but, you know, if we don't get to you this time, please, uh, please come back and next time we're going to be doing these quite a bit every week um, for the foreseeable future, so we hope that everybody comes back and can contribute at some point. Um, when you do speak for the first time, we would love for everybody to say their name and their pronouns. An example of this would be for myself. My name is Kate Wolf, and I'm she, her, hers. Um, we ask for that for the first time speaking, so everybody knows who we're talking to uh, or who is speaking. Um, if you get inspired to ask a specific question during this time, we actually have a Q&A that we're going to be setting up at the, at the end of the talk. It's about 10 minutes long, but what you need to do is actually submit to the Q&A button down here that you can see. Um, that's going to allow you to put your questions in there. And then once uh, we move on to the Q&A portion, um, Jake will actually say your name or click you so you become a mute and you can ask their question directly. Those questions can be directed at me. They can be about do the work or they can be about the topic at hand, whatever you're comfortable with. If you you want to know what I ate for lunch, just text me. Um, but other than that, uh, let's go through a few ground rules so we keep things moving, flowing really nicely. Um, we try to keep each topic to about five to seven minutes. We know that there's a lot to talk about here with human behavior because really, honestly, it's endless. Um, so if we need to revisit this, we're happy to do that um, and, and talk through with everybody. <laughs> I have dogs here, so apologies for all the barking in the background. Um, it'll be five to seven minutes per topic. And if we don't get to your specific topic, we'll let us know afterwards and we'll add it to the next round. Um, in terms of the second discussion or forums that we're going to talk through, this will be an area for you to deep dive. So please ask and be respectful of others, but please ask any questions that you'd like to ask. Um, lastly, this is a creative and positive space. So we do have some ground rules on behavior internally. Um, what we're looking to do is we're looking to create a place where you can challenge and be honest, but, but be kind. And that's important to us. We want to keep the focus on the work and the talent and the culture of advertising, which is a broad topic. So we should be pretty safe there. Can you swear? Fuck yeah. Swear all you want. As long as it's in the idea of being uh, emphasizing a point or being excited about something. We will not condone or allow swearing at each other, any name calling or any pointed negativity. Um, 
And lastly, if it feels right and you want to show some love, give some compliments. Uh, they are free and we are here to celebrate that creative thinking. So uh, I'm always up for a good compliment, but I'm also ready to dish them out. Um, this is a safe, safe space for that. So it does look like we have a few people in the space, which is very exciting. Um, I do want to note that our court is in session. And by that, I mean our board here uh, or the court, as we call it, to do the work is present. Um, they will contribute. I just want uh, everybody to know that they're not planted. They are designed to be a part of the conversation. So please jump in uh, anybody within the panel and, and we can have an active group talk all the way through. But I think that's the last of these housekeeping items. So now let's get into the discussion. Today, we're gonna to talk about behavior. Um, we're gonna be talking, I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview, but before I do that, I wanted to ask a pretty generic question to just see how the audience and, and the group feels. Um, first and foremost, as we know that social media has democratized the landscape of marketing, gave everybody a voice. Uh, has anybody seen a brand behaving a lot like a person and, and a good example of that? So that's kind of an open-ended question. Is anybody willing to jump in now? We'll see, Brian, maybe. Hey, Kate, how are you? Hey, hey, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Great. Good. Uh, yeah, so do you have a good, uh, do you have a good example of um, a brand behaving like a person? I mean, I would have to say, I think right now in the current environment with all that's going on, I think Nike is getting a big call out uh, especially for the commercials that they've been putting out around social uh, justice and equality, equity. Um, so I think that's a brand right now, as far as if we're looking at campaigns, I think that would be one that I would, I would look to, but I, I think um, we're having to look to a lot of brands. So how, how are they pivoting at this point in time and what does it look like and what is right? But yeah, so that'd be one I'd look to right now. Very cool. Yeah. Um, we totally agree on Nike. Um, Nike's done a really, really good job of always supporting uh, whatever cultural cause is happening or conversation. They're very good at um, of engaging within that dialogue. I will say, um, I don't know if you saw this, but Nike is also within the Black Lives Matter movement specifically. They have been at the forefront of that. Um, but one thing that we are gonna talk about in terms of principles is they are getting some backlash in how their board is structured and their lack of representation there. And so that's gonna be something that we talk about in terms of authority and consistency. But I think that's a good transition actually into um, some of the more, I wanna start with just a general understanding of behavior and persuasion and then kind of jump in from there. So in terms of how people operate and what gets people to actually mobilize and take action. Um, there are six basic principles of persuasion uh, that everything that we do at Lupine Creative, as well as, you know, um, smart marketers in terms of how to get manipulate people into behaving a certain way or having a conversation where it's the return on investment is on both sides. Um, we look at these six basic principles by Dr. Caldini. Um, if anybody here has ever taken Psych 101 in college, you're probably familiar with that name. He is very prevalent in those books um, because he's clear, concise, and easy to understand. Uh, the six, I'm just going to go quickly through the six basic principles and then kind of talk about how they're affecting LGBT culture right now and what brands can do to engage in those conversations and what they shouldn't do. Um, so those basic principles are liking, reciprocity, social proof, consistency, authority, and scarcity. Um, let me quickly go back over those. So everybody, liking is basically like, what is the connective tissue that brings the two people together or two brands together or two entities together? Uh, I like the same thing you like, et cetera. Um, this is the commonality play. It's the easiest one and the one that's most prevalent in all conversation and communication, whether that's a brand or just two people meeting at a restaurant. Um, reciprocity, people like to be treated uh, the way they treat others. They wanna be repaid in kind. It is that simple, brands need to behave that way. Um, social proof, this is my favorite. Um, I believe that social media is one giant kindergarten. Uh, it's a giant show and tell class. Um, and it lets people show, they wanna see, show that they're doing what they're saying they're doing and they wanna show that, they're, that, that it's worth talking about and they're special. Consistency is making sure that people are not erratic 
Uh, same with brands, that your behavior isn't oscillating between or, or, is, or is continuous um, in a way that you're trusted. This is the number one thing that builds trust in terms of behavior. Authority, you got to be an expert on something, uh, whether that's Nike and that's athletics and fitness, uh, or some would even say now culture. Um, or it's, you know, somebody that Dr. Caldini, who is the authority in all things persuasion. Um, and then lastly, scarcity, it drives action and creates urgency. Um, people want more of what they can have that, that there's less of. Um, that's a really important thing. And we definitely see that within the cultural zeitgeist when a conversation is trending, people want to get in board, on board with it because they don't know when it will end. And so there's an urgency factor there. Okay. So that was a lot of talking, apologies, um, but wanted to get everybody on the same level in terms of understanding of those six basic principles. And then I do have some kind of fun questions around how people are being. So, so before I asked, you know, how we're seeing brands starting to behave like people, um, I'm looking now and saying, has anybody seen a brand really start to take in their values and then exercise those in the LGBT space? So anybody that's actually putting their money where their mouth is, for a lack of a better term. Graham, you got one? I, see, I saw you get lit, lit up. Does anybody have an answer? No? All right. Well, I will keep going then. So in terms of putting your money where your mouth is, um, I think a good example of that is going to be when people, the balance of co-opting a movement versus collaborating on a movement. A great example of that is um, the Ben and Jerry's. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ben and Jerry's, but Ben and Jerry's has been supporting LGBT marriage for years. Um, it started actually in Vermont when they renamed their um, chubby hubby ice cream to hubby hubby ice cream. And then they have managed to continue to do that throughout the last 10 plus, 15 plus years. Um, talking through Australia when their um, same sex marriage was on the table and they changed their flavor to chocolate and chocolate instead of double chocolate. Uh, to the UK when it was recently up there where they changed to Appley Ever After um, with their apple pie flavor. Um, but they are continuous in that space. And they also donate and show up uh, so they are a true brand that I feel like speaks to the community really well, but also supports in the right way. So for me, that feels like a collaboration as opposed to co-opting. Anybody have another example of something like that? Yeah. Um, not to be too ice cream obsessed, but I mean, you know, Big Gay, Big Gay Ice Cream uh, sort of does a great job of proving that it's aligned with the queer community. And if that's a company that is not like LGBTQIA owned, that would be like a, a travesty. Um, it, it sort of, um, it, it sort of stands out truly. Like there's a bunch of other brands that are so, like so endemic to gay culture that it's like, well, that's practically a gay brand, but like, that's not true. And like, maybe some of the reasons they do it is so they can, you know, make sure they also like, you know, um, reach out to mainstream culture because we have such power to shape culture. So it's like, if we're cool with you know, queer people, we're cool with, with you know, we, we might sort of be used as a marketing tool in that case. But I mean, what a, what a necessary example to cite in terms of like, they really put their money where their mouth is. And it's really funny. I've had around the last time like Chick-fil-A controversies came up, I had no less than three different friends come up to me and say, what if Chick-fil-A, but gay, and it's like, why not? You know, it's, it's it, you know, the, the whole, the whole issue of, um, you know, how you can sort of change these other institutions from within when it's like entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurialism is still such a powerful thing. Why not just make the, the version of it that's, you know, of something that you would like to buy, but can't align it with values that are more um, embracing of, of other cultures and then just make that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I think when you can find an endemic way to really support and infiltrate a community, not just like from a communication standpoint, but physically show up in ways, whether that's in a financial support or even the board or owner showing up and, and, and supporting physically in a space, I think there's a value construct there that's very important to consider, especially in 2020. 
um, when we have a young generation coming up that is truly hyper focused on values and inclusion. And I think brands would do themselves a service to get away from the divisiveness that you know a Chick Fil A has right now. Anybody else want to weigh in? Okay, I would say Tom's is another brand that you would think about. You know, I mean, aside from having some really cool shoes, um, I think they've got great designs, but they also give back to the community with the proceeds, right? So they put portion goes to LGBTQ um, people and the homeless. So I think that is, I think when we look at brands that are being responsible, other than just plastering and changing logos, it's really about what are they doing to give back to the community? And I think that would be definitely one thing that I look for in a brand uh, when I look at what, what are they doing for us throughout the year. And to me, that would be definitely Tom's and their community and CSR components. And that's really important. And Brian, can I ask a follow-up question to that for you? What's, what's CSR? <laughs> no, no, not, not what's, but yes. Explain what CSR is in case somebody doesn't know what that is. Yeah, no, I think cor corporate social responsibility, right? So what are you doing to give back to the communities in which you operate and what you serve? So that is CSR. And what would you think best practice would be for like a big brand like Tom's or even a brand like Gillette? How do you think that they can get involved that way? I think they have to look at the, you know, what is the, what is the buying power of the, of the brand and the, and the demographics, right? And I think through that, looking at what are the communities that they're serving, what are the communities that are buying their product, and then internally they need to really identify what, what organizations speak to their organization. And that might be, maybe that's polling employees uh, to ask them about what's, what's special to them and what speaks to them as, a, as an employee population of members of that company. Those are just simple ways that, again, it's not about forcing anything down. It's more of an organic conversation with their own internal employees. How do we build a relationship with uh, the communities in which we live and operate? Um, and I think giving back is just like, that's fundamental to what these brands need to do as we look forward. Yeah, completely agree. I think that actually is a great transition into um, well, we talk a lot about here, that's a collaboration play. It's finding ways to work within a specific community or subset of our culture, right? Um, and saying, okay, what matters to you? How can I show up? Um, but we know that there are definitely ways, that's a collaborative way, but there are definitely, definitely times in our culture, especially during big spikes like pride and holidays, where brands try to jump on a bandwagon or as I like to say, co-opt instead of collaborate um, to get involved with the LGBT community. And while the intent is positive, sometimes it can have serious negative backlash. Does anybody have an example of seeing a brand try, but maybe in the wrong sort of way, um, get involved with LGBT? No, quick cameo, it just appeared. Um, okay, well, Ziggy had some input. So he just whispered in my ear that it does look, I don't know if anybody remembers World Pride 2019 uh, in New York, but there was quite a bit of backlash around the, the misuse or aggressive use of rainbow and what that meant um, in terms of doing a pride or LGBT initiative from a brand. So. Uh, if to jog everybody's memory, um, rainbow was everywhere. If you walk down New York, almost every front window just had rainbow displays. But there was a lot of discussion about what that means and what brands are actually doing in order to make a difference and really connect with that community. A great example of that is, I don't know if you guys remember, but Listerine just came out with a bunch of bottles that were rainbow colored. Um, but that was the extent of the entire LGBT initiative. Um, thoughts on whether or not that works? Yeah, I read, I read a really good article uh, in Vox that was sent to me by, I don't remember who, but it was basically sort of speaking to 
like when those things happen, the Listerine bottle is like such a perfect example. Uh, it, it's, it's, they do it in the interest of, if, if nothing else, it's visibility, right? And, and that's not enough in a world where so much like change is needed and when we know what change is, but like, it's sort of funny too, because, you know, if we, if we look at our own childhoods and the fact that we would have been like desperate to see a rainbow anywhere or something to like latch onto, it's, it's sort of funny. Like it, in one respect, it, it's, I don't think it's, you know, necessarily enough um, to, you know, to, to even help me identify myself, like as a queer person, if you're not like contributing to the community. Right. Um, but it's, it's, it's sort of funny that that article, by the way, also mentions that it's that process it's by which brands are sort of getting involved unmasked with like, you know, just sort of doing the rainbow washing and selling the products is also the very means by which, um, we are sort of, we, we, we moved away from the rebellious spirit of pride. So like, you know, during all of our Black Lives Matters conversations right now, we're like, and then, and then sort of pride leans in that direction as well in terms of solidarity and like, oh yeah, it was like, you know, queer people of color who like led the revolution, et cetera, et cetera. And it's so funny because you, you get all these, you get all these protests and it's like, oh wow, this was the thing. Like this is, wait, not only is this like more inclusive than the parties, but this is also how like change happened, right? And then you sort of go like, oh, and then, and then brands get involved and then it becomes a party. And then you sort of go like, oh, well, is this, are they friends? Are they those friends that show up for the party but don't show up when you need to like get your car jumped? Like, is that the thing? So it's, it's truly just like, you know, it, what you sort of talked about earlier in terms of like, you know, brands acting as people, brands acting as friends. I believe that brands can act as friends. And now is the time where it's just like, look, you know, we have a place for party friends. I don't mind party friends as long as I never need them to jump my car. But there's some of these brands that have jumper cables and they have a car that they can come over and help me and they're not helping me. So it's just like, you know, it doesn't matter if you have like a, you know, if you're, if you want me to come to a party with you on Friday, I can't, I can't drive because <laughs> my car doesn't work. So like, so help me get to the party and maybe you'll be a better friend. To me. Yeah. No. And that's, that's exactly the point. It's like, as brands start to behave like people, how do we, tell them how to show up and what they can do better. And I think what you touched on there, Graham, is consistency. And as I said before, it's one of the most important things. Erratic behavior, uh, erratic behavior diminishes trust. So if a brand is now claiming and having a tone of voice and a value construct and everything they do needs to be routed through those filters, um, the same goes to the, the actual actions taken. And that is really where brands need to catch up and that's a big thing around behavior, you know, exactly what you said, which is I have the party friend, but the party friend is not the person I call when I need help or support, but it's also not the person that I trust. Yeah. And, the, and, and they all want to pretend to be that friend and they all like bandy around like the, the verbiage of trust. Like it's something that, that they have a right to do, but they don't, they don't earn it. It's, it's yeah. crazy. Um, and also, and also I think it's worth noting that like, you know, in terms of like not knowing they know what we need. There's no, like, that's what this age is all about. That's what's different this year is like the inability to stop pretending that people don't know what these movements need and that like, you know, that they can educate themselves. So in terms of like friendship, again, I look at a lot of these brands and the way they're behaving and it harkens back to like when I dated someone who, uh, it was in my twenties and it was when I still gave a fuck what I looked like. And he's just like, so what's, what's wrong? You seem like you're down. I'm like, oh, I don't get to work out. And I, you know, I don't, you know, I feel like my body is not great and I feel like I'm out of shape and I'm out of whatever. And then his response was frequently to buy me ice cream because he had, because, because he wanted ice cream and it's like, you like ice cream. And it's just like, wow, you're really like not listening. So it's, it's not enough even to try to like be the trusted, reliable thing when you're reliably bringing me ice cream and I'm asking you for like weights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, that, and, and, and that, that's a really good uh, transition into what brands can do better to connect with LGBT. And I can kind of start that off, but then I would look for everybody's opinion here as well. Um, I think it's really important. The first thing you have to do to connect with any, any community, not just a multicultural or um, minority community, is listen and that's a really, that's a thing that is missed constantly. And also a huge part of what Do the Work is about. We are actively listening. We are trying to figure out 
who, what queer voices are, are tampered down and what queer voices are raised up and who is doing the tampering and raising. And I think that's a really important note. And so I'd like to know, have anybody seen a brand do a really good job connecting with LGBT by listening specifically? Well, I will give a shameless plug for some work that I've done before. Um, we, uh, back in my old career, when I was at a company called RQ, we worked on the Big Little Lies um, uh, event, essentially, uh, to kick off season two. And actually what happened was is HBO had heard from uh, Nielsen that they massively over indexed in season one with the LGBT community. And instead of just celebrating that internally and high and then moving on with their lives, they said, hey, this is a really interesting thing. Mostly because Big Little Lies has no LGBT character plot lines or LGBT actors or actresses. Um, so while Sex in the City had, you know, uh, adjacent plot lines and a few LGBT characters, they were mirroring the same, the same volume of tune in. And so they wanted to figure out a way to connect with their LGBT audience. And the way they did that was they created an event that was specific for the LGBT community and that was run through our queue. But what we did there was we listened specifically to how the community was talking and we played into some of the trending subculture trends that were happening within that community and capitalized on that momentum. So it felt like we were playing a little bit of insider baseball. An example of that is we sent everybody tea kits and parasols so they could spill the tea and avoid the shade during season two and create a bunch of different content throughout the entire series um, every single week in these small vignette videos. And we also sent a whole bunch of other kits, including a series of wigs, because wigs were very big in the zeitgeist of LGBT QIA culture during that time frame um, for each one of the characters, allowing people to transcend and become one of those really empowering, fierce women uh, that were all within both the cast as well as the characters. Um, so that's an example. Does anybody have another example where, where a brand has done a good job adopting the vernacular of the LGBT group? I have a uh... One that I could just throw in really quickly, Kate. Hi, everybody. This is Jake. I'm the man behind the curtain. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I saw a campaign for MasterCard. Um, I can't remember how long ago it was, a couple years ago, maybe, um, where they really took the insight that a lot of transgender um, individuals, you know, feel marginalized by people not respecting their gender identity or the new name that they have, you know, um, taken up taken and I MasterCard did a really amazing initiative as well as a campaign which is always nice to have legs beyond just you know a film or a print campaign but they um, but they issued cards to these people who normally wouldn't be able to apply under that name because legally it's their name is something else um, so I just thought that that was a really interesting um, way to approach it and, and an insight that you know helped people um, rather than just communicating to them. So I thought that was really nice. I love that. That's a great example of like listening and then finding a need and fulfilling it because I think that does two different things. I think that shows that one, MasterCard listens and two, they act and acting beyond just messaging. I think when you end up just talking at each other with no action, that also can diminish trust. So to remain consistent, it's really great to see both that verbally communicated as well as acted upon to support in a real way. So that's a great example, Jake. In terms of connecting or listening to communities, let's, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about networks. Um, I don't know if everybody remembers this, but it wasn't that long ago in 2019 when Zola did an ad that had two lesbians getting married and a kiss uh, during a montage of a series of weddings. And Hallmark pulled that from their actual channel, wouldn't run the ad, due to protests that were happening. Does anybody have some thoughts around that, how that could possibly affect Walmart? I'm sorry, not Walmart, Harma, Hallmark, as they're going into the next winter holiday season, um, because they had made it out unscathed because that happened towards the end. But now as we're looking at 
coming into their biggest season. Do you think there's going to be any backlash there? Or do you think people forget? Hi, guys. This is Andrew. I'm on the court with, with Kate and Graham and everyone. He, him, his. Uh, yeah, I think I don't think this is going to be the case of short-term memory. People could and should be holding Hallmark accountable um, for, because I think obviously the ultimate irony that this pointed out even after the unfortunate decision to pull the ad and then reinstate it was the fact that, of course, the LGBT community is not represented in Hallmark's movies themselves. So I think it's a dual sponsor and programming issue for them. And I think honestly, the easiest way to solve it going forward is to commit to a certain threshold of representation in their movies themselves. I mean, they produce what, I, I think I read at least like somewhere between, anywhere between 30 and 50 holiday movies a year, like bare minimum, they could commit to 5% of those having some LGBT representation. Um, I mean, <laughs> don't even get me started on the racial diversity issues as well. Just all, all sorts of problematic uh, things that they, that they could address. But yeah, like the fact that, yeah, still in 2019, we were still facing the issue of whether or not to even air an LGBT inclusive ad on mm -hmm. a, on a mass market network is a sign of how much progress we still have, have to make, unfortunately. Yeah, and like, Andrew, I personally hope and believe and I would love to get everybody's opinion on this, but seeing these kind of moments like Hallmark making that huge misstep um, and, you know, and then basically drawing attention, as you said, to the other missteps or structural problems that they have with terms of their content capture and distribution. Do you think companies like Netflix, who are actively taking a stance to involve more LGBT characters within their uh, originals and purchased um, content, as well as taking a stand on trolling. I don't know if everybody saw this too, but the um, person that posted the SpongeBob SquarePants and uh, somebody said, like being filled up with a funnel, and that meme went viral, saying that LG that basically Netflix was trying to shove LGBT content, unnecessary un LGBT content down everyone's throat um, for them to just aggressively come at that this year and say, we don't believe that any LGBT content is unnecessary. Do we think that they're going to make a move to create even more Hallmark style um, holidays as they've been doing that increasingly and, and including more LGBT? What do you guys think? I can take that one again. I mean, yeah, I think a the barrier for risk with Netflix is different than a ad supported network like Hallmark, right? They're they're less beholden to, you know, stakeholders in the corporate world that an ad supported network is. So, you know, for them, the only real risk of of taking some of those more uh, public stances on the LGBT community, on Black content, etc., is you might see a slight pullback from their subscribers, but given how many millions of new subscribers and continue to add, you know, very different uh, barriers to risk for them. So I think for one thing, yeah, like, you know, when, when you're not, when, when you don't have that same dual revenue stream, you can, you can afford to be a little bit more outspoken and inclusive in, in your programming. So uh, there was a movie that was relatively popular last year in the holiday time frame called Let It Snow that had an LGBT narrative. I believe they had a couple others as well. So I would like to see them do even more. Hopefully we see some intersectionality with people of color within those LGBT yep. narratives as well. Totally agree. Well, that kind of brings me with, with that intersectionality piece. That, it, that brings me to the LGBT acronym in general. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a subculture with many subcultures within it. And one thing that we see, and I think that was prevalent during World Pride with the rainbow washing of, of marketing that happened in, in last year, I, I think, and I'm interested to know, do you think that brands should be more targeted in diversifying their message within the LGBT subgroups? Do you think we should be getting down to specific vernaculars of the gay community, of the lesbian community, of the trans community in order to connect? Hey, Kate, it's Brian. He hey, Brian. Is hey. So I think if we want to be true marketers and we want to have brands that are <clears throat> speaking to their customer base, they have to acknowledge um, all the different layers of the community that we have, right? And I'll be honest, like 
there's things about the community I still need to learn. Every time I feel like there's there's a new letter that might be added to to our list, and we are a very large, uh, if you like you said, subgroup, um, and it continues to grow and evolve. But yes, if we want to reach out to the customer base, we have to be inclusive of the customer base. And I think initiatives like uh, ANA AIM or see all those all those campaigns that are really fighting and helping us to understand like what does the base look like and do those ads resonate with people is really important. Totally agree. I think um, I wonder how brands can do this well. I feel like often brands get I, I'm, and I'm hoping that in the past brands have looked at the LGBT and honestly all minority groups as a box to be checked and a message to be delivered and don't look beyond the surface unless, unless specifically tasked to do so within a specific initiative based on a moment of culture. Um, do we think brands need to start with a generic message to drill in or do you think they should be doing the opposite and going in the specific route or specificity to then reach the larger audiences of LGBT? I think the opposite, you know, one, one example that I'm really intrigued by that's playing out right now is, I don't know if you guys have seen what Goose Island is doing with Shea kool for the Shea Cool Ale that they've co-created together. Not only is that, you know, a, a nice entry point into the general market, you know, LGBT audience and certainly the, the ally, huge ally following for, for RuPaul's Drag Race, but mm -hmm. I don't know if you, you're also aware that the, the beneficiary cause for that is trans tech which is interesting, you almost never see brands, to your earlier point, Kate, uh, supporting trans-specific causes, and the fact that trans tech is uh, providing important funds and resources for uh, employment and educational resources for, for the trans community. I mean, I can't applaud efforts like that enough, uh, and the fact that there's a social enterprise model built into sales of the beer to support that is, is a nice look that I hope we'll see other brands start to follow. I love I love that and something that you know was going to be in the next topic which was basically within inclusion marketing there's always a level of exclusion and I feel like especially a hyper marginalized group of individuals are trans people and then on top of that black black trans people are incredibly marginalized and so knowing that you know during the black lives matter movement that's happening right now and having so much focus and there is focus on black trans lives um do you think brands are going to get involved and how if so how should they and andrew I, i'd be happy to pitch that right back to you because i feel like you're you have a good grasp on that yeah i mean it all goes back to a what are brands doing outside of june at the end of the day and b yes how can they tap into those specific narratives. Now, obviously with someone like Shay, it, it even does get a little gray, right? Because Shay does not herself identify as trans, but it's important that she's using her platform and this unique opportunity to give back to the trans community. Um, I think the next step that I would like to see is more brands working with trans talent, you know, I mean, someone like Laverne Cox who has a massive profile, why isn't she getting cover girl deals? Like things like that. That could be, you know, I, well, to that exact point, I don't, you know, what happened this past week with L'Oreal and I'm blanking on her name, but the transgender uh, brand ambassador who they've recently uh, re-upped with, that was a really- They hired her as, a, yeah, they, as yeah. a board and executive member. Yeah, that's, that's huge. You know, L'Oreal mm -hmm. uh, was also singled out by Fast Company recently as having uh, the, the most- uh, see, the most senior most CMO who herself is part of the LGBTQ community. So I would hope that that played a role as well. I mean, the more that we have members of the community in those CMO and, and decision maker seats, the more change we'll start to see as well. Yeah, and I think that's a great example of kind of using those basic principles of persuasion. If we're looking at the LGBT audience, L'Oreal has been honest and transparent about their mistakes in the past. They immediately took action, which is urgency, right? They expressed authority within the makeup and, and beauty industry and then acknowledged their pitfall. Um, they have been consistent in that action to fix that problem. And they have taken immediate steps uh, to show the world in terms of social proof that they are intending to continue this and it is not a campaign or a pride moment. And then lastly, like reciprocity and liking, 
Um, they found the commonality of beauty and all forms of it. And then, of course, reciprocity, they're making sure that their actions are equated into actions on an individual level, allowing everybody to feel heard. And I think that's a really good response, um, which will, in fact, all of those things put together will persuade the LGBT community, hopefully, to get back on their side. But consistency is really important. So we have to continue to see that throughout time. It can't be a one and done Band-Aid fix. It does have to be on a long-term plan. Um, any thoughts around brands actually taking a deep dive into the community and saying that they're here to stay in terms of support? Has anybody seen anything like that? Um. I mean, one, one additional thought on that, um, there was a great article, uh, really an investigation that Vox.com did last year uh, that took a look at what brands did with their LGBTQ merchandise after June. Mm -hmm. um, do they donate it? Do they still sell it to make that exact point of what are you doing outside of Pride Month? Um, and, and they found that H&M was actually the most progressive of selling their, A, selling their Pride merchandise well into the fall while others extended it for like a, a couple of weeks as if it was a holiday promotion, right? And discounted it just to get it off shelves. And then they donated it, composted it, whatever they did. So yeah, the more that we're seeing brands, you know, the, the simple action of, of selling <laughs> that inclusive merch <laughs> throughout the year, you know, extending the, the donation thresholds, you know, it's great that a lot of brands are matching and capping their contributions usually at that magic number of 100,000, but if they can do more, why shouldn't they, right? Like, yeah. Just, yeah, more diversity of the the causes that are benefiting it. You know, there there are, in fact, other organizations other than GLAD that you can donate to. I, I would love brands to, to see that. <laughs> um, I think that's, that's a great point. And, you know, something that we see uh, in my line of work, um, something I see quite a bit is, you know, culture in terms of entertainment, like the content that's created outside of the marketing space often dictates the larger culture at hand. And that means like television shows, movies, pop culture in general. Um, and we're seeing a very uh, fast and great skew towards LGBT communities and representation with shows like Legendary and We're Here or uh, Pose, um, where we're seeing a lot more of stories that have been unearthed over time and everybody in from a pop culture and mass standpoint is getting peeks into what has been in existence for quite some time and has actually been the underpinning for most of the culture that we all enjoy today. Um, knowing that, I see, because I work quite a bit with, with networks that are making those shows and advertising those shows, we do a lot of brand deals with those communities because it makes sense for us to be supporting the people that we are making the culture and, and content around. Um, do we think that CPG brands and other service products are gonna come into play, uh, play a little bit near future? And do we think culture is going to dictate that, that flow? Yeah, well, to your exact point on CPGs, it's I've, I'm really impressed by what P&G has done por portfolio wide this year in particular with their support of LGBT media. Um, I don't know who uh, here still subscribes to Entertainment Weekly, which is now a monthly, but P&G has. Uh, so, so yeah, Kate, you've, you've probably seen the very yep. interesting, uh, you know, sponsored content that they do throughout everyone from their global CMO, Mark Pritchard, uh, shares testimonials. There's very uh, a really nice mix of different parts of the community represented in their advertising across different brands. Um, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier with Gillette and how that was a groundbreak groundbreaking initiative for for trans rep representation, etc. So yeah, I think PNG. Anytime you see, you know, a mark, PNG is still arguably the the most influential marketer in terms of you know what what they place their bets on from a cultural perspective, people yeah. will follow. So I think hopefully that will become contagious in the, <laughs> in the Junes and years to come. Oh, I hope so. I mean, I feel like, I, I think there was a great article the other day, I believe it was in Variety, um, that kind of talked about how culture is, the more, the more representation we have within culture mediums like content and television and pop culture and books, Etc. cetera, um, 
the more sentiment goes up in terms of how people look and revere the um, LGBT community. And so as we start to build a larger um, body of work and representation, I feel like brands who who are are tangent to that movement will follow immediately and we'll start to see more and more and thus we'll get away from moments where we have people in the world saying things like unnecessary lgbt characters when really that's just a characteristic of the character themselves and not a defining plot line and i think that's um, an important distinction and i hope that brands start to see it a little bit more where it is less uh, about a specific niche or subset, but more looking at it as part of the dynamic that makes up a person, but not necessarily a plot driver. Anybody have thoughts on those things? You know, I think you, I think you said something really smart. Just as it relates to culture, though, I think we have to be very clear that it has to be authentic, mm -hmm. right? And it has to resonate with the people and. and Consumers, people will call out the brand very quickly when they know that the brand is not being authentic and that if it's just a, a band-aid or a solution for the moment or a way to make a quick dollar on a group. Um, so that's just one thing I know. I know we all look for the brands that we know and, and love and purchase ourselves. So I think that's something just to keep our, our mind side on. Yeah. I'm not sure if, uh, if you, okay, yeah, my mic is on. Um, so, so what, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't sure if I was muted or not still. The, the interesting thing, you know, to have Brian's point sort of follow from the conversation about like, you know, people who are really in it and who have you really seen devote yourselves, right? It's, it's really funny because it's all of this, like my brain goes to, I've seen this ad, I've seen this ad, I've seen this ad, and then my brain goes to, but wait, what do I know that they've done? Right. So, and I think that's the way that like this consumer psyche is starting to work more than ever has before in terms of, I've, I know what they've said and we used to just have to like operate on that. And now it's like, Oh, and this is also what they do. And, yeah. and that takes a lot of research and that takes a lot of homework and you have to like sort of know these examples. And it's, you know, Andrew, for example, is like rattling off all these things because of his encyclopedia brain. And I'm just like, I don't have encyclopedia brain for all these and I keep having to keep track of them. But like, here's something to keep in mind is I've had so many conversations with people in our industry who say a change is coming and that change is gonna be in, uh, encompassed by mobile uh, and by your phone. So what you're gonna be able to do is swipe over uh, a product and you know, you, you see what the product says, you see what the product you know, wants you to see, and we look like this and we talk like this, and here's our nutritional information that we have to tell you, and then there's this. But then once you sort of like are able to go into, you know, look at it through this other digital window, you're gonna be able to see who they give money to, and you're gonna be able to decide what issues you really wanna gauge. So like, you know, if you really decide that like, you know, giving to LGBTQ uh, rights is a deal breaker for a brand or if being black owned is a deal breaker for a brand. You'll be able to measure it just by that criteria when you, when you swipe your phone over it. And it won't come tomorrow and it might not come next year and it might not come in five years, but it's inevitable that like, you know, as we're building an AR world that we'll be able to see brands through the literal immediate window of our own values and then make new decisions. And that's when the, you know, the disparity between what they're showing me and what I know they do completely disappears. Yeah. And honestly, that's, that's a great example that I brought up in the very beginning of what's happening with Nike right now. As somebody that has been so active in striking up and supporting the conversation, but then having the, the you know, veil pulled back a little bit to say, okay, but you don't make space for Black lives on your board. Um, and I think that's an important distinction. I think now we're at a time, especially during the Black Lives Matter movement, and, and, and I think we'll look at, look at this and hopefully it sets precedent for all civil rights. You know, we, we say, okay, it's time now that everybody says something that they mean, but then they also act on it in every way possible, creating space for diversity and opportunity for others. And I think that is something that I hope to see. And I think the world is moving in the right direction for. Okay, well, I think that is all our questions portion right now. Um, I think we can hand it over to Q and A. Uh, we have only six minutes left, but I think we had one or two questions in there. Let's see.
No, it looks like all of our questions have been answered. All right. I was just going to say, we think we've covered Graham's question in that last bit. So. Oh, fantastic. All right, guys. Well, um, that's, I think, it. Does anybody have any other questions that they weren't submitted? We'll give it another second, and then uh, otherwise I'll wrap it up. All right, I'm going to wrap it up, guys. All right, so this has been this week's of Office Hours um, for episode of Do the Work. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody that contributed to the conversation. It was great to hear all the different perspectives. Uh, I love sharing these thoughts and these questions with all of you. And your voices are so important to us as we aim to amplify them further. So check out the next session, and you can find all the scheduling on dothework.com. That's work, and it's spelled W-E-R-Q. At the website, you can sign up for email updates, community connections and activities, et cetera. Also, we ask that you follow us. We're new. So please follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to get super professional with it, we're also on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, and of course, you can find us on um, all of channels that you need, but you can also contact us through those and we will respond. Um, on this site, you can also contact and share further suggestions of conversation topics and things like that. So please reach out. There are so many opportunities for us to have a conversation together. So don't hesitate. We're here to help amplify your voice. But with that, I want to thank you all again for watching. It has been a tremendous pleasure and a great conversation. Um, but I have to go. So um, bye.